Our next paramyx of virus is parainfluenza. So parainfluenza generally will cause mild cold-like symptoms and a disease manifestation that we call croup, which is basically like inflammation in the larynx, the trachea, and the, and the bronchi. Uh, there are four serotypes. Generally, we see the infection um, only staying in the respiratory tract, usually upper respiratory tract. However, it can get down into the lower respiratory tract and cause more severe disease. We generally don't see them go systemic or get into the bloodstream, but again, they can cause those cold-like symptoms, bronchitis, and croup. Because there are other serotypes um, and just because of the way the virus itself works, infection does induce protective immunity, but it's only a short duration. So we don't get lifelong protection from a single infection. It is transmitted person to person via respiratory droplets. And generally a patient will first be infected when they're a child under the age of five. And because of that lack of lifelong immunity, patients can be infected throughout their lives. So croup, that infection in like the larynx, the trachea, um, and the bronchioles can cause swelling that can block the airway. Um, another infection that can cause that type of swelling that blocks the airway is Haemophilus influenza. But we can tell the difference between para-influenza and Haemophilus influenza because remember, the blockage from Haemophilus influenza is caused by swelling in the epiglottis. We don't see that with para-influenza. So if a patient has that type of croup, that swelling, that inflammation in the very, very upper parts of the respiratory tract, um, you can usually differentiate para-influenza from Haemophilus because of the lack of swelling in the epiglottis. Uh, these infections would be diagnosed by the presence of virally infected cells. Um, there are hemagglutination assays and RT-PCR that can be done. But again, in most patients, it's going to be mild cold-like symptoms. So a lot of patients aren't even going to bother to seek treatment because they're already going to clear it and be fine. For patients that do develop croup, that swelling in the upper airway, it would be monitoring to make sure it doesn't get too severe to block the airway. Um, and there are no antivirals or vaccination that are used uh, for parainfluenza. Our next para in, uh, paramyxovirus is mumps. Uh, mumps causes swelling of the parotid glands, the salivary glands. So you get this really characteristic um, big lump on the face. The that's why it's called mumps. Um, so there are other areas of the body that can be affected. Um, one of, I guess, the more common areas besides the salivary glands is actually the testes. And so this is a picture of, of a patient with swollen testes from mumps. So when the virus is acquired, it's an upper respiratory virus, but it can go viremic, unlike parainfluenza and go to these other tissues. Um, in some patients, it can also go to the central nervous system. So I don't follow hockey. Um, I just don't. It's not a, not a thing I ever really got into. But the person on the right is a, a apparently is, was a professional hockey player. And uh, mumps went around their locker room uh, for this professional hockey team. So he, he's um, looking very unhappy right now. Again, it can go uh, local replication in the respiratory tract, but then go viremic, causing systemic infection and go into the parotid gland um, and then to other areas of the body. Um, and it is thought that infection in the pancreas could be associated with the onset of juvenile diabetes because it causes destruction of some of those cells in the pancreas. Again, uh, incubation period, Here's where you have that swelling the, of the parotid gland up in the mouth, um, the orchitis, the swelling of the testes, and potentially meningioencephalitis, but that's a, a relatively rare complication. 
Often patients do um, experience an asymptomatic type of infection. For patients that do experience symptoms, most commonly it is gonna be that swelling of the salivary glands and others. Um, swelling in the testicles, that orchitis can lead to permanent sterility. So for male patients who were infected as children, um, that could lead to those lifelong consequences. Virus can be recovered from the saliva, urine, the throat, other body secretions. Um, again, it can usually be diagnosed by the fact that you've got that giant swollen jaw from the um, swollen salivary glands, but you can also do reverse transcription PCR or ELISA. We have a relatively effective vaccine. Um, it's the only way to really prevent infection. Um, there was actually an outbreak in 2014 in Columbus, Ohio, where 230 patients were diagnosed with mumps. So um, for those of you who think about vaccines that you've gotten or that you've heard of, you've maybe heard of MMR. So M, measles, M, mumps. R, we'll talk about later, that's rubella. But so measles and mumps, you should be vaccinated against both at the same time. Um, sometimes it's just not as effective. And so we do see higher cases of mumps generally every year than we do of measles. But mumps is also a much less severe infection. So very rare to have the meningioencephalitis rare to have that orchitis and the permanent sterility. So it's a little bit less concerning to see these higher numbers of mumps, and it's not necessarily indicative. Well, some of these are indicative of a lack of vaccination, um, but some of them are just indicative of the fact that the vaccine isn't as effective as some others. Our final paramyxovirus is respiratory syncytial virus. Um, you've probably heard about it in the news as RSV. This um, is the most common cause of fatal acute respiratory infections in infants and children. Nearly 100% of children will be infected by the age of two. It's very, very common. What it does is it can induce syncytia formation, um, but you can also have necrosis of tissue um, in the lower respiratory tract, and that necrotic material will clog the airways, causing respiratory failure. Infection is not protective. Up to this point um, in vaccine trials, actually having vaccination led to enhanced secondary infection. Now, I say up to this point, there has been a big push um, especially using some of this mRNA technology that's been used for COVID-19 vaccines to generate uh, RSV vaccines. And some of those are showing really strong promise. Um, I did just see a headline today that Johnson & Johnson decided to pull theirs out of clinical trials, but other uh, pharmaceutical companies are still doing clinical trials on what appear to be relatively effective um, RSV vaccines. So that's really good news because it's estimated that there are worldwide 64 million cases per year leading to 160 deaths. Um, and some of the most recent data that I pulled, again, from some of those articles about the vaccine, um, that if you look at two, there are two population groups that are at risk for this infection, children under the age of five, and adults over the age of 65. So for those two groups combined, every year there are over 230,000 patients in those two groups only that are hospitalized in the US. And again, combined 14,500 deaths. The majority of those deaths, like 14,000 of them, are in our elderly patients, but the loss of 14,000 elderly people is nothing to sneeze at, and the loss of 500 children under the age of five is also a big tragedy. So hopefully these vaccines um, are very effective, are safe, and will be introduced uh, to the market relatively soon. In patients who acquire the infection, I told you for the most part, it's gonna stay to the upper respiratory tract. You're going to have a relatively mild type of infection 
Um, however, in some patients, anywhere from 25 to 60 percent, depending on the year, depending on the patient, um, you can get involvement of the lower respiratory tract. It is very contagious and it is transmitted by aerosols and fomites. And so this data here shows what um, physicians have been looking at as a very worrying trend of a significant increase, like, like 20, 30 fold increase um, in the amount of patients, especially the, the, this blue line represents children between the ages of zero and four who have been hospitalized with RSV uh, since like October of 2022. So what a lot of physicians have been warning parents of young children or guardians of young children about is the idea of a triple pandemic, COVID-19, flu, and RSV. So RSV, there's really nothing you can do about it. COVID and flu, they were really pushing for vaccination so that you weren't having so many infectious patients coming to the hospital. Again, the most um, common symptoms that we would see in older children and adults are gonna be symptoms of the common cold. In younger children, febrile rhinitis and pharyngitis. So basically they have a fever, um, they might have a runny nose and a sore throat. And then um, in very young children under the age of one, fever, cough, difficulty breathing, cyanosis, they turn blue because they're not getting enough oxygen, pneumonia in the elderly, those with chronic heart or lung disease, or those who are immune compromised. So it can be diagnosed by nucleic acid tests, the RT, reverse transcription, PCR, or immunoassay. Um, in severe disease, there are nucleoside analogs that are available for treatment. And again, we are looking at right now the development of uh, vaccination to help protect, especially our most vulnerable patients.